When you think of the early days of NASA, the one name that comes to mind is John Glenn. He was part of Project Mercury. On February 20th, 1962, he was launched into space in his capsule, Friendship 7, and he became the first American to orbit the Earth. And while America cheered him on as a space hero, things weren't quite nearly as perfect as they seemed on the surface. Only a few knew what actually happened that day and just how close John Glenn came to dying. It was only nine months earlier that President John F. Kennedy had committed America to exploring space. Rockets were unreliable. They often blew up right on the launch pad. Space was an unknown. In fact, until the Soviets put their first man into orbit, Kennedy thought it was impossible. In the space race, America was that far behind. The Soviets had orbited their first cosmonaut 10 months before Glenn's flight. And if Glenn succeeded, America would finally catch up. Where did John Glenn come from? Well, he was from the little Appalachian town of Cambridge, Ohio, which boasted a population of just a bit more than 14,000. What set him apart from the other astronauts was that he was a member of the United States Marine Corps. He had joined at the start of World War II, not long after the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor, and as a pilot, he flew an F-4U Corsair in the Pacific. After the war, he stayed in the military as a flight instructor. And when the Korean War broke out, Glenn returned to combat. He flew with a Marine Corps squadron, VMF-331, in a Grumman F9F2 Panther from the airfield of K-3, what is known as Pohang Air Force Base. The squadron flew low-level ground attack missions against heavy flak, and twice he returned from missions with over 250 holes in his airplane. After his first tour, he managed to get back into the war through an exchange program with the U.S. Air Force. Then he flew F-86 Sabres with the U.S. Air Force's 25th Fighter Interceptor Squadron out of K-14, Kimpo Air Force Base. The Air Force pilots used to joke about John Glenn's gung-ho Marine attitude, though. He promised to become an ace before the war was over, so the Air Force pilots painted the words MIG Mad Marine on the side of his fuselage. Glenn laughed about it, then added his wife's name and the names of his two kids. He shot down three Soviet-built MiG-15 fighters in less than two weeks before the armistice ended the hostilities. That was a pretty good score, even if he didn't become an ace, especially because he had only been able to fly 27 missions with the Air Force before the Korean War ended. After the war, Glenn became a test pilot. Then later, he was one of over 500 who applied to NASA's new astronaut program. Seven were accepted. He was one. He was also the oldest among them, but that also meant he was the most experienced. After two years of training, he was selected to fly on the third Mercury mission. He was to be the first American to orbit the Earth. He blasted off on February 20th, 1962. When Glenn reached orbit, he was 162 miles up and going 17,500 miles per hour. He was the fastest American in history. The problem was that one of his capsule's control thrusters had already failed. That meant his autopilot was unusable. What was worse, the engineers had theorized that no astronaut could manually fly a spacecraft. Without the dynamic pressures of airflow, the capsule was expected to simply tumble out of control, spinning and twisting as it hurtled its way around the Earth. Only an autopilot could fly it, they said. And without the autopilot, re-entry back into the atmosphere was impossible anyway. There'd be no way to keep the critical heat shield facing into the atmosphere as the capsule plunged back to Earth. Meanwhile, the public was cheering at Glenn's successful launch, completely unaware of what was really happening. As it was, Glenn's first goal in the mission was supposed to have been to test if the engineers were right. The two previous Project Mercury missions were both suborbital, and they'd relied on the autopilot from launch to splashdown. Now Glenn was going to test controlling the capsule in each axis of flight separately. He was supposed to switch off one axis of control at a time, test whether he could keep the spacecraft stable, and then switch it back on whenever he started the tumble. He had trained extensively for the extreme G-loads that he was expected to experience. And now, without being able to rely on the autopilot at all, 
he had no choice but to fly it by hand, not in just one axis of flight at a time, but in all dimensions at once. The engineers were astonished. Glenn managed it perfectly. The score was Marines 1, Engineers 0, but the games were just beginning. The engineers realized that Glenn would have to fly it by hand through the buffeting of atmospheric reentry as well. He might be able to control it in space. Indeed, he seemed to be doing so. But could he manage it through the buffeting he was expected to experience during reentry? One mistake, and the wrong end of the capsule would face into the heat. Without the protection from the heat shield, he would burn up. Suddenly, for Glenn to save himself, the engineers were counting on him to be able to do the one thing they had thought impossible only minutes before. He would have to fly it all the way down by hand. With the flight control problems, the mission was cut from a planned seven orbits to just three. Still, before they risked re-entry, there were a few other goals to try to accomplish. For instance, the engineers had also theorized that an astronaut couldn't swallow food while in space. They had sent up tubes of food pastes and powders that Glenn was supposed to try. These were packets of pureed and powdered mushroom soup, orange and grapefruit juice, cocoa beverage, pineapple juice, chicken and gravy, pears, strawberries, as well as beef with vegetables. Glenn sucked them down easily, but reported that the food tasted terrible. Only an engineer could come up with pureed chicken in a toothpaste tube. The score was Marines 2, Engineers 0. As well, the engineers had theorized that in space, over time, an astronaut's eyes would lose their shape. Their vision would go blurry and out of focus. To test that, they pinned a small eye chart to the instrument panel, and Glenn was supposed to read from it every 30 minutes. Again, Glenn proved the engineers wrong. His vision was perfect from the beginning to the end. The score was Marines 3, Engineers 0. Another theory the engineers had was that in weightlessness, the fluids of the inner ear would flow freely around and cause nausea, vertigo, and motion sickness. Again, Glenn experienced no problem at all. The score was Marines 4 and Engineers 0. With re-entry just an orbit away, suddenly a warning light illuminated back on Earth at Mission Control. That meant that the clamp that was supposed to hold the capsule's heat shield on until after re-entry had somehow prematurely released. Without the heat shield, Glenn would certainly burn up in the atmosphere, no matter how well he flew the capsule. It was either that, the engineers realized, or just that the warning light had malfunctioned. They decided not to tell him about it, but wondered if Glenn's warning light in his capsule was also illuminated. If not, maybe the heat shield hadn't detached after all. To avoid telling Glenn about the problem, the flight director asked a few of the ground stations to inquire about it as he passed overhead. The first time Glenn heard the question, it seemed normal enough, and he replied, negative. When the next ground station asked the same question, he got suspicious. When the third asked, he knew something was up. He scanned the panel, but found nothing wrong. He realized that maybe it was the heat shield. Normally, prior to re-entry, the capsule's retropack was supposed to be jettisoned. When the engineers told him to attempt re-entry with it still attached, he knew what was up. It was a smart move. If the heat shield had come loose, the retropack straps might hold it on just long enough to get the capsule back down to Earth. But was the retropack going to cause the capsule to tumble out of control anyway? There'd never been aerodynamics tests on that. He would have to hand flat even as he was buffeted around. He was one tumble away from death. Still, it was the only way. As Glenn passed over Texas, the retropack was fired. Wisely, he combined hand flying with a partial use of his autopilot to stay perfectly aligned. Five seconds into the re-entry, however, the retropack straps burned off. Pieces flew past his window. Just ten seconds later, the retropack fell away too. The heat shield held. The only malfunction had been the warning light itself. Glenn's splash down in the Caribbean was near perfect. The final score for the mission was Marines 5, Engineers minus 2. After being picked up by destroyer USS Noah, for a time Glenn relaxed and dictated some notes about the mission, then he was transferred to an aircraft carrier. Ultimately, he was flown back to Florida. As the first American to orbit the Earth, John Glenn had become a national hero.
Throughout his life, John Glenn faced extraordinary challenges and risks, yet he smiled through it all. A Marine through and through, he never showed any fear, whether in air combat or in orbit. He loved every moment of it. And as for what it felt like to fly into space, he used to say, I was sitting on top of two million parts, all built by the lowest bidder on a government contract. I'm Thomas Van Hare, and this is Historic Wings. Remember, there's always more to the story. And if you like these videos, please subscribe and give me a like. Consider sponsoring me through Patreon or PayPal. The links are included in the description below. Also, be sure to visit historicwings.com for over 400 articles about aviation history. I use the talents and capabilities I happen to have been given to the best of my ability, I think there is a power greater than I am that will certainly uh, see that I'm taken care of if I do my part of the bargain.